स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Namaste. We carry forward our summing up and discussion of the lectures. So, in module ten, we were looking at labor market economics and conservation, and we began by saying that poverty is closely related to environmental degradation because poverty leads to less per capita resources, which leads to overpopulation, which leads to more stress on land, and then. to land and environmental degradation loss of productivity which then continues with this poverty so essentially poverty moves as a vicious circle so if there is poverty in a society or in a certain section of the society in that case the per capita resources will be less and when the per capita resources are less then the productivity is also less because when we talk about agriculture people do not have access to fertilizers or pesticides or high yielding varieties of seeds so when we have less income when we have less resources then the crop fields also give out less production and when that happens then when uh, you have a large population then low productivity would mean that larger areas are required to feed that population and so we find a direct correlation between poverty and the loss of natural resources or over exploitation of natural resources now here it is important to emphasize that yes we do have over exploitation of natural resources even in a developed society but primarily what we have observed is that the uh, forests that are converted into agricultural fields is much greater than the forests that are converted into other resources in a more developed society that is to speak when the agricultural productivity increases because people have access to more resources and they can go with a more modernized agriculture then the yield increases and in a number of cases it has been observed that when the yield increases then the society requires less amount of land to feed the people and then the society also starts turning a few of the agricultural fields into forest or say things like agroforestry now in the case of agroforestry the crop fields are also planted with trees and so you have trees and the crops that are growing together but this is only possible when the agricultural productivity increases which is possible when we will have sufficient access to resources like fertilizers pesticides yielding variety of seeds and agricultural implements but when that is not there then the poverty continues another thing that has been observed is that in the case of many poor societies that do not have access to things like health care parents find that a large proportion of their children die before reaching adulthood and so as an insurance to ensure that at least some of their children reach adulthood people start to have more number of children so when the death rate is more because uh, people do not have access to hospitals and modern medicine then that also increases the birth rate and which is what we observe in the in the primary stages of demographic transition high birth rates and high death rates and in a number of cases when people start to get some amount of medical care the birth rate remains the same as before but the death rate decreases which is where uh, a large portion of our current world today is so people are getting access to more modern medicine modern healthcare but in a large sections of the society the birth rates are still high so excess of births and less deaths or lesser deaths as compared to the previous generation means that the population also increase 
and when population increases this also further aggravates the poverty because again the per capita resources are even lesser similarly when people do not have education then also we find that more number of children are born because people need to be enlightened about such concepts and so in a large number of poor societies we find that this vicious cycle goes on continuing now when you have this vicious cycle then you will find that the environment is being over exploited and one way to stop the over exploitation of the environment is to bring these people out of poverty and so because poverty has a very intricate relationship with conservation so the study of poverty becomes important for the uh, study and practice of of conservation and so in these lectures we looked at what are what causes poverty what causes low wages what keeps these people in a poor state and we found that there are several factors so one is that when we look at the market for the factors of production now these are the markets where the firms buy and the households sell and the households are selling land labor and capital so if we talk about the sale of labor that is people make their uh, labor available for wages then what determines how many people will get employment and what will be the wages that they will get so to understand that we looked at the demand and supply in the labor market so the labor market is like any other market you have a demand curve you have a supply curve and the point where both of these meet gives the equilibrium and that equilibrium gives us the number of people that will get employment in this market and the wages that they will receive and when the wages are set then the next question is how many people will get the employment that will also depend on what is their productivity and in that context we looked at how a profit maximizing firm determines how many labor to employ and here we looked that when the number of wages uh, when the number of workers increases the output increases because more number of workers means that the total production will increase but then this total production does not increase at the same pace so when we move from one labor to to two labors versus when we move from 50th labor to 51st labor the changes are very different when we shift from one worker to two workers the production increases by a larger amount than when we are shifting from 50th to 51st worker and this is known as the law of diminishing marginal product so marginal product is the change in the quantity of output divided by the change in the number of workers that are employed and we have seen that a lot of rational thinking occurs at the margin and so the profit maximizing firm here again thinks okay what is the marginal profit that i am getting by employing these laborers and that marginal profit is given by the value of the marginal product of labor minus the wages now this again is a simplification because in a number of industries we will also subtract things like raw materials or things like the cost of capital or the cost of land but to simplify things we are taking that everything else is zero and we are just considering what is the marginal profit if we have an extra worker and here we find that In, because this is a competitive firm so in this case the price is fixed and with a fixed price the marginal product of labor is directly proportional to the value of the marginal product so there is a correlation between both of these that is a direct proportion so if you multiply the value the marginal product of labor with the price then we will get the the value of the marginal product of labor so in this case we are doing 5 which is the price multi multiplied by 50 and that is giving us 
the value of the marginal product so like 5 into 50 is 250 5 into 40 is 200 and so on now because of diminishing marginal product the marginal product is decreasing so the value of the marginal product will also decrease but the wages they are constant because they are determined by this demand and supply curve so the number of workers that any profit maximizing firm will employ will be given by this marginal profit and so if we subtract so 250 minus 100 is 150 200 minus 100 is 100 150 minus 100 is 50 so what we are observing is that the marginal profit is decreasing as we move from less number of workers to more number of workers and we will reach a point where the marginal profit is now zero which means that before this point if the firm hired one extra labor or one extra worker then there is an increase in the profit because the marginal profit is positive but after this point when an extra worker is hired then the cost of hiring is greater than the value of the marginal product of labor which would mean that by hiring an extra worker the firm will increase its losses or decrease its profits and so the firm will stop here the firm will hire no more than this value and for any profit maximizing firm we can compute what is the number of workers that will be employed by that particular firm by looking at such calculations and we can also look at these things through curves so we can draw the production function which is the output per hour versus the number of workers and it is getting flatter because here again the marginal product of labor is decreasing with more and more number of workers that are being employed so in this way uh, and the cause of this diminishing marginal product is things like crowding insufficient access to equipment chit chatting and other things now here we are not considering the behavioral factors so we will look at behavioral factors in a short while so the marginal product is decreasing the value of the marginal product is decreasing and if the wages are constant then the point where the value of marginal product intersects with the wage line gives the profit maximizing quantity of the number of workers to be hired now in this case we saw that the demand for labor is dependent on the value of the marginal product and so the number of workers that are hired will depend on the marginal product of the labor and the price of the output that is if the labor productivity increases so every labor is able to produce more number of output items then the value of the marginal product of labor will increase and so more number of workers may get hired or if the price of the thing that they are producing if that increases then also more people will be hired now we in this context we also talked about the supply of labor and the supply of labor depends on the trade off between work and leisure or the value that is given to leisure if people value their leisure much more then they will be less inclined to work it depends on things like social tastes whether women prefer to work outside home or not at what age do people start to enter into the market it depends on changes in the alternative opportunities especially things like the agricultural season it depends on immigration and movement of labor if more uh, people uh, are immigrating into the area then the supply increases and here again the supply and the demand curves tell us the equilibrium in the market and we looked at shifts in the labor supply and we looked at shifts in the demand and in both the cases there are changes in the equilibrium wages and the equilibrium employment and we saw that there is a similar market for land and capital so land labor and capital are the three factors of production and in this case we had said that 
the amount that is paid to each factor of production is derived from the supply and demand for that factor and the demand is dependent on the marginal productivity and in equilibrium each factor of production earns the value of its marginal contribution to production and so if there is a sector in which people are contributing more to the development of something or to the production of something that is valued high in the market in that case those people will be earning more but if there are people who are contributing little to the manufacturing of something that is valued high or they are contributing substantially to the manufacturing of something or the production of something that is valued very less in the market in that case those people will be earning less and less earning would mean that these people might move into poverty next we looked at earnings and discrimination so in this case we said that apart from the neo classical theory of distribution we also have other factors and these factors modulate the results of the neo classical theory of distribution one such factor is the compensating differential or a difference in wages that arises to offset the non monetary characteristics of different jobs so if there is a job that requires a night shift or that requires working in conditions that are dangerous or that are difficult or that are dirty then those people will be paid more to compensate for working in such difficult uh, conditions so this is one difference another is the human capital or the accumulation of investment in people such as education and on the job training and we look back with with increase in education or with the increase in training the income increases and there are several factors why this income increases one it increases the marginal product of labor because the people who are more learned the people who are more trained probably are at a much better position to understand any problems whenever they arise so they will be quicker in solving the problems and so the marginal product of labor increases then it is a compensating differential for the cost of education both in terms of the opportunity cost and time that is if a person went for a higher education that then this person spent many months or many years of his or her life in getting that education and probably also left any income that he or she would have uh, gotten if they were employed and so because it is a tough thing to learn more to spend time and effort in education so there is a compensating differential and the third thing is that these are signals for the higher ability because if somebody has had a in education from a prestigious institution and has good grades it means that this person can say that okay i have these good grades from this prestigious institution because i am intelligent because i am hard working because i am punctual and these grades become very good signals for the prospective employers similarly if somebody has worked in a prestigious company this also serves as a very good signal so we looked at uh, signaling and that there are two characteristics of signals it must be costly and it should be more costly for the lesser quality product or person and education and training are good signals because for a person who is not intelligent or who is not hard working or not punctual it is difficult to have good grades on their grade sheet but for those people who are intelligent and hard working and punctual then it is easier for them to have high grades on their grade sheet so education and training become very good signals then ability effort chance and appearance are four other things that determine how much wages will be paid so people who are good looking probably will get more wages especially in those jobs that involve public dealing similarly uh, if there are two people who are same in every aspect but one person has a greater ability probably because of genetics probably because of upbringing or probably because of exposure then that person might earn more 
or if everything is same then the person who is working more will earn more or in certain cases there are also chance factors involved people who graduate during times of depression they will uh, earn less than people who graduate at times when the market is bouncing so there are several other factors that also govern how much people will earn superstar phenomenon so in certain fields if there are conditions in which one person is at the top of the market is providing a, a product that is very good and everybody wants to have that product and the market is such that that product can be made available at a very low cost then we will observe things like the superstar phenomenon in the case of superstar phenomenon the uh, the wages or the income that the superstar would be earning will be way greater than the income that anybody else in the same field would be earning good examples include actors or singers or sports people then we looked at the cases of above equilibrium wages so in certain cases the wages that are determined by the equilibrium in the labor market which is determined by the demand and supply of labor the people earn way more than that wages that is they, are, they earn much greater than the equilibrium wages and this could be because of say a law that says that this is the minimum wage that you can offer to a person or it can be because of things like collective bargaining through unions or it can be because of above equilibrium wages being paid in the form of efficiency wages in which case the companies or the firms pay more than the equilibrium wages so that the good workers are retained in the company so we have different reasons for which by which uh, there will be differences another cause is discrimination in which people of uh, different races ethnic groups sex age place of birth they are offered different wages and while in some cases the discrimination gets solved by the competitive market because the firms that care only about profit will make products at lower cost than firms that do discriminate but in certain other cases we might require uh, the role of the government so like in india we have several provisions in our constitution and also in several laws that prohibit discrimination and in certain cases they provide for a positive discrimination for those classes that have historically been discriminated so essentially while the new classical theory of distribution says that the amount paid to each factor of production is derived from the supply and demand for that factor and that in equilibrium each factor of production earns the value of its marginal contribution to production but then this is also modulated by so many different effects next we looked at income inequality and poverty so income inequality is the disparity of income distributions with a high concentration of income usually in the hands of a small percentage of the population so in the case of income inequality what we are saying is that even though the per capita income of the society may be high it is possible that only some people will have this income or this wealth and the rest of the people will be poor so that is or such a condition is known as income inequality and we have income inequality in this world there are certain areas where the wealth is below 5000 dollars and there are certain areas where the wealth is above 100000 dollars and in this context we looked at the income share in india and if you look at the cumulative income share if uh, so here we have the deciles and this is how much each decile is earning and if you draw a straight line and we draw a curve that touches the top of all of these then we will have this triangle that is divided into two portions a and b and gini coefficient of inequality is given by a divided by a plus b that is the area of this curve or the area of this triangle that is in this section above the curves and this income inequality shows itself in a number of criteria especially the economic and the social criteria so those areas that have higher incomes will have people 
that have access to health that have access to education we will find that the infant mm -hmm. mortality will be less the maternal mortality rate will be less the under 5 mortality rate will be less the life expectancies will be higher and typically more and more people will be employed they will be educated they will be enlightened and so the income inequality is very important because it shows itself in a number of different socio economic factors then we talked about poverty poverty is a state or condition in which a person or a community lacks the financial resources and essentials for a minimum standard of living and in this case we talked about the absolute poverty and the relative poverty absolute poverty is when people do not have sufficient resources for a decent level of living whereas if everybody is having or not having the uh, decent resources even then in any society we will have certain people who have more resources and certain people who have less resources and the people who are having lesser resources will be said to be relatively poor because they are earning less than the median income in that particular society or the country now in the case of poverty we define a poverty line which is an absolute level of income set by the government for each family size below which the family will be deemed to be in poverty and here we can look at the poverty rate or the headcount ratio which is the percentage of the population whose family income falls below an absolute level called the poverty line and if we look at the levels of poverty in our country the headcount ratio has been going down but if you look at the number of poor then we will find that over time the urban poor has increased in number a bit then decreased whereas the rural poor have been reducing in number primarily because the poor people in the rural areas are also shifting to the urban areas and when we talk about poverty we can talk about several categories of poverty there are some certain people who are always poor that is they are always below the poverty line certain others are usually poor that is at some points of time they will be above the poverty line others are churning poor which means that they are moving in and out of the poverty line other people are occasionally poor which means that they are generally not poor but sometimes they may go below the poverty line and there are other people who are never poor and income distribution and poverty rate don't completely quantify inequality because the what matters is the standard of living which can be modulated by in kind transfers or the economic life cycle and in this case uh in certain cases the person's normal income versus the income in a particular time may have an impact in the form of differences in the standards of living so the standard of living is more determined by what is the normal level of income that the people are earning and in cases when uh, the situations become very dire as in the case of a drought then people can uh, say borrow money from either a bank or from their relatives or from money lenders and overcome this small phases of life so the average income that people are earning it becomes more important now here there is the normative question should income be redistributed and we have different pol political philosophies we have the uh, the philosophy of utilitarianism that states that the aim of the government should be to maximize the utility that is maximum benefits for maximum number of people and here the utilitarians would say that the value of money for a person who does not have any money is very large but the value of money for a person who already has large uh, money with them is not that large and so the government should aim to redistribute the income take it from the rich people and give it to the poor people so that the benefits of the society they get maximized so that is the philosophy of utilitarianism liberalism on the other hand looks at government policies that should be just as evaluated by an impartial observer and this political philosophy would suggest that yes some amount of income distribution should be done but we should not completely bring equality in the society so that people have an incentive to work hard to become rich and we have 
the third political philosophy which is libertarianism and in this case it states that once the rules of the games are established the government should not alter the result that is it is not a function of the government to redistribute the income between the rich and the poor so basically whether income should be redistributed or not is not just an economic question it is also a philosophical or a political question and depending on which society people live in there will be different uh, policies that are being adopted now in our country and in a number of countries governments are trying to reduce poverty through use of minimum wage laws but the thing is that it creates a surplus or through welfare schemes such as old age pensions and disability schemes negative income taxes in in kind transfers and anti poverty programs such as manrega program now in the 11th module we looked at practical issues in economics and conservation and the first one is consumer choice where we asked this question that okay there are certain products that have very less impact on the ecosystem there are certain products that state that these have been harvested from sustainably managed resources like sustainably managed forest there are certain products available in the market that say that these products do not emit that high level of pollution but the thing is in a number of cases these products are typically a bit more pricier in the market as compared to other products that have been harvested from an unsustainably managed natural resource or that are giving out a large amount of pollution now the question is when we want people to go for the environmental friendly options do they actually go for it so what determines what the consumer would choose because what the consumer chooses ultimately governs what will be produced in the market and in this context we looked at several of these labels that talked about sustainability but we also looked at discounts that are there on those vehicles that are bs4 vehicles and so when we look at consumer choice there are two things one is the budget constraint the limit on the consumption bundles that a consumer can afford means that a consumer cannot have each and everything that he wants because there is a limitation on resources there is a limitation on the amount of budget that this customer has which is known as the budget constraint and we saw the example of two products samosas and lassis if the budget constraint is 100 rupees then only certain combinations of samosas and lassis can be bought and in this context we also looked at the second um, criterion which is the indifference curve a curve that shows consumption bundles that give the consumer the same level of satisfaction so essentially if you have more of one and if you have very less of the second thing then that would give you a certain level of satisfaction but then when you have something that is of a very large quantity then probably you are not deriving a very large amount of satisfaction from that so in that case you will probably reduce the quantity of what you already have in excess of and probably go for something that you already have very little of and this would bring us to different indifference curves so if this is an indifference curve it means that this point or this point or this point or this point all of these give the consumer the same level of satisfaction and we looked at uh, the marginal rate of substitution the rate at which a consumer is willing to trade one good for another and different points have different marginal rate of substitution which is given by the slope at these points so if you have any point and you draw a straight line that is touching this point the slope of this line will give you the marginal rate of substitution and at this point it is a very flat line at this point it is a very vertical line so different points have different marginal rates of substitution then we looked at different properties of indifference curves higher indifference curves are preferred because people want to have more of both the products that is in these two indifference curves this one will be preferred then we said that the indifference curves are downward sloping because if one good is consumed less 
the other should be consumed more and the interference curves do not cross because that would lead to a situation where a and b are giving the same level of satisfaction b and c are giving the same level of satisfaction but then in the case of c the consumer is having both more of good one and more of good two and in the case of indifference curves we say that more of the goods is preferred over less of the goods and so this will create um, a, a serious error in uh, because in this case uh, more of both the goods will be the same as less of both the goods which cannot be true and so the indifference curves cannot intersect each other and we also saw that the indifference curves are bored inwards since consumers have more willingness to give up a good that they already have a lot of so this is the general shape now the thing is when you have uh, the indifference curves and the budget constraint then the point on the highest indifference curve that is within the budget constraint that should be chosen and we also looked at two specific indifference curves that is the perfect substitutes such as rupee notes and rupee coins so in this case the indifference curve is a straight line and we looked at perfect complements such as right shoe and left shoe in which case the indifference curves are at 90 degrees and when we look for the optimum the optimum point is the line uh, is the point on the budget constraint curve that is on the highest indifference curve because if the consumer wants to have this point then the budget does not allow because the budget can only allow up to this point and if the consumer chooses something like this then the consumer could have chosen this point which has more of both the goods and so this point is a more preferred option and it is within the budget constraint so by looking at both, uh, at these three curves we can say that the optimum point that is chosen by the customer is the one that is on the budget constraint line but is also touching the highest indifference curve and in this context we looked at two kinds of goods normal good a good for which an increase in income increases the quantity demanded such as pizza and there are inferior goods for which the increase in income reduces the quantity demanded such as bus rides because if somebody is having more income then probably they would not want to use the bus they would probably want to use the taxi or they would want to use their own vehicle so buses or bus rides are inferior goods because people demand less of them if they have more income they shift to something else and uh, in this context we also looked at the income and the substitution effects income effect is the change in consumption that results when a price change moves the consumer to a higher or lower indifference curve that is in this case we are asking the question that if the consumer had more income what would he or she choose so if income is more it means that the budget constraint line is shifted to the right which means that a higher indifference curve can be chosen on the other hand we have the second thing that is the substitution effect the change in consumption that results when a price change moves the consumer along a given indifference curve to a point with a new marginal rate of substitution so in this case we are asking the question that if the income remains the same but of the two goods one becomes more cheaper then what would the consumer have probably the consumer would want to have more of that thing that is cheaper and in this case the consumer is not shifting the indifference curve but is moving along the same indifference curve and we looked at this example of samosa industries again where the price of samosa falls and so uh, uh, in this case when the price of samosa falls then the uh, income effect means that there is an uh, an increase in the effective income so more samosas can be bought and more lassi can be bought but when we look at the substitution effect then samosas are cheaper as compared to lassi and so more samosas can be bought or less lassis can be bought and this will result in the final effect of more samosas but more or less or equal amount of lassis so this is the income and the substitution effect and we also looked at uh, the uh, the law of demand that uh, can be derived from these curves and there are two exceptions to the law of demand the webland goods and the giffen goods webland goods are luxury goods 
whose demand increases with the price. Things like luxury cars that people want to show off. Now, if the price of the car reduces, in that case, it does not serve the purpose of showing off. And so people will demand less of it. Given goods, on the other hand, are inferior goods whose demand increases with the price. And we looked at this example of meat versus potato. So if the price of potato increases, the effective income decreases. And when the effective income decreases, people would want to have less of the higher price product and would want to have more of the lower price product. So between meat and potato, because potato is a lower price product, so people will want to have more of it. So even though the price of potato has increased, people will uh, consume less meat and consume more potatoes. So this is an example of a Giffen good. And we looked at uh, the salient points. Consumer choice is the branch of microeconomics that, that analyzes how consumers maximize the desirability of their consumption. Desirability is represented by indifference curves and consumption is limited by the budget constraint. So in this case, what is happening is that when we want to have people shift towards environmentally friendly products, then we would also have to ensure that these products are available at not too high a price. So we can play with two things. We can play with the desirability of the, uh, of the, of the ecologically sustainable products by say means of advertisement or by means of education of people. So in that case, we can increase their desirability. But at the same time, we also have to be mindful of the budget constraint curves. So we cannot have the environmentally sustainable options that are too expensive. Now, when we talk about things that are too expensive or less expensive, here is where the government can play a role. So if the environmentally sustainable option is too expensive, the government may give a subsidy or the government may put an additional tax on something that is not environmentally too sustainable. So in that case, both the prices will come to a similar level and that would urge people to move towards environmentally sustainable options. So this is how consumer choice helps us to understand how we can move, shift people to environmentally friendly options. Next, we had to look at asymmetric information and behavioral economics. And we said that uh, in a large number of cases, people are not rational. And why are people not rational? Because rationality is bounded. And rationality is bounded because we have um, a dearth of information and we have a dearth of processing power. If we had all the information and if we had all the processing power and if we, we had all the time, then probably we would have made all the rational decisions. But in a number of cases, we do not have the complete information, we do not have sufficient time, and we do not have the processing power, because of which rationality becomes bounded. Now, when we have a dearth of information, it is known as asymmetric information. That is, if there are two parties in a transaction, one party knows more and the second party knows less. Now, the thing is, what are the mechanisms that are available so that there is uh, a transfer of information from one party to the other party. So this is the field of asymmetric uh, information. And we looked at the marginal product and we said that in the real world, workers do not often perform when they are left unsupervised, which is known as moral hazard, a tendency of a person who is imperfectly monitored to engage in dishonest or otherwise undesirable behavior. So in this case, what we are looking at is the impacts of psychology or the insights from psychology into economics. So earlier we had begun with very simple models and we said that, okay, everybody is a rational person. Everybody is doing everything um, as uh, so as to maximize their welfare or the surplus. But now what we are observing is that no, everybody is not rational and everybody is not trying to maximize their surplus. In certain cases, people are just shunning away from the job. And this brings us to moral hazard. And because of moral hazard, uh, we have an increase in the cost. So the uh, uninformed party has to put in efforts to get the information out. So in the case of moral hazard, people will want to go for a better monitoring. Have CCTV cameras, have more number of supervisors, or pay above equilibrium wages so that people work or give delayed payments such as year-end bonuses. 
now all of these are adding to the cost of production so all of these are bad for the economy and when something is bad for the economy is bad for everyone but still people have to go with these similarly the second thing is adverse selection in the case of adverse selection people are in a position in which they can be easily duped such as if somebody goes to a used car market the salesman knows a lot about the car but the buyer or the prospective buyer does not know about it so in this case the salesman can try to sell a car that is not a good car now this is adverse selection now people can respond to adverse selection by say saying that okay this is the used car market i am not going to take any used cars which is avoiding the market now because markets increase the surplus and because markets are a good way to organize economic activity if people start to avoid the market it's not good for the economy or the other thing is that people can ask that the vehicle be inspected by a third party now when the uh, vehicle has to be inspected by a third party now this is increasing the cost now it would have been much better if the salesman were honest but because of psychological attributes because of behavioral differences there are a number of people who are dishonest and we need to bring these characteristics into our economic models so this is asymmetric information and a way out is through signaling and screening so signaling is an action that is taken by an informed party to reveal private information such as advertisements or good grades on cv so advertisement is a good signaling because a company that is making good products will probably have a larger share in the market and if they have a larger share then they would be in a better position to advertise their product as compared to another company who is not making good products and so is not having a good market share they will simply not be able to afford advertisements especially those on the television and so advertisements become good signals and there are two characteristics of signals the signals should be costly and they should cost less for the high quality product and so things like advertisements or good grades on cv they become very good signals The second option is screening, an action taken by the uninformed party to induce the informed party to reveal the information. That is, if you go to a used car market and if you tell the salesman that okay, I like this car, but I am going to get it inspected by a third party, and if the salesman says no, no, sir, don't you trust me, or no, no, sir, there is no need, we have tested this car, it means that there is something amiss. Otherwise, the salesman should have agreed. and so by asking this question that you want to get the car inspected by a third party and is the salesman okay with it you are inducing the salesman to give out the information so this is an example of screening and in behavioral economics we integrate the insights from psychology into economics we looked at bounded uh, rationality we looked at heuristics heuristics are mental shortcuts rules of thumb how do you make a decision when you do not have complete information or when you have less time or less processing power so in that case we make use of things such as heuristics effect heuristic whatever is the gut feeling we go for it availability heuristic whatever comes to the mind first is what we go for effort heuristic how much effort are we putting into getting something is determining its value escalation of commitment if you have already spent a lot of money we will be in a position to spend even more familiarity is heuristic if something is familiar we prefer that and bounded rationality often leads to cognitive biases a systematic pattern of deviation from norm or rationality in judgment so when we talk about cognitive biases we are saying that okay we should have gone with the rational judgment but because we have a dearth of time processing power or information we often make mistakes and these are cognitive biases and these include things like confirmation bias if you have made a view about something you will only take in that information that supports your view and you will discount everything else hello effect if 
something is positive in one area, we'll take that it is positive throughout. On effect, if something is negative in one area, we'll take it to be negative throughout. Now, these are different cognitive biases and we need to be aware of them because these play a role whenever people are making decisions. Then we looked at the valuation of natural resources and we looked at uh, the classification of resources, biotech versus abiotic, potential, actual, reserve and stock resources, renewable or non-renewable resources. And we looked at the economic value. Now, economic valuation is necessary to aid cost benefit analysis when we are giving up one thing for another or to provide evidence to aid habitat conservation policies. That is, if we have a solid evidence, then probably we will be working towards conservation in a much stronger manner. Or to evaluate the economic compensation that is legally required. If somebody destroys your forest, if somebody destroys the habitats, how much are you going to charge that person would depend on how much valuation you have put onto your uh, habitat or your environment. And so we have to look at economic valuation. Now total economic value is a sum of use value, which is when you are using things and the non-use values when you are not using things. Use value is direct value that you are using directly. So if we look at things such as timber or we look at fuel wool, these are things that we are using directly. So these are direct values. Then we have indirect values that we are not using directly. Things such as watershed benefits or things such as support to the evolutionary processes or support to biodiversity. We are using them, but we are using them indirectly. And third is the option value, which tells us that how much is the value that we are deriving for just keeping the thing as it is, because we might use it in the future. That is the option value. Then non-use value are those values that we derive when we are not using the thing. Existence value. We feel good because something is existing. We feel good because there are giant pandas. We feel good because there are polar bears. Even though we might never go and see them, but just because they exist, we feel good. That is existence value. Altruistic value. Okay, I'm not deriving a value, but somebody of my generation is deriving a value. Somebody is getting employment because there are tigers in Kanha. So I feel good that somebody is getting employment. So that is an altruistic value. I'm not feeling good about myself, but I am feeling good that somebody is getting benefited. And we have the bequest value. What we are leaving for our children and our grandchildren, our future generations. So that is the bequest value. And we can do a computation of all of these values by the methods of valuation. And there are three accepted approaches. Market prices, in which case we ask how much are people actually paying. The second one is circumstantial evidence, such as what would it cost to replace this thing? Or what, what is the cost of the next best alternative? If you do not have mangroves, if you want to put up a tsunami barrier, how much will it cost you to make, make that barrier? If forests are not purifying your water, what will be the cost of the water purification plant that you will build up? Or what will be the cost of the diseases that people will get if the forests are not purifying? That is the damage cost that is avoided. And the third approach is surveys or express willingness to pay that, such as the contingent valuation method. And in the last module, we looked at case studies economics of protected areas. So we looked at what is a protected area and in our country we have four things, natural park, wildlife sanctuary, conservation reserve and community reserve that are protected areas. And we looked at uh, how we prioritize things. So species that are keystone species that are very important species, umbrella species that have a large home range and flagship species that people find themselves attached to. These are the species that need to be prioritized. And when we are doing conservation, we go for those species that are all three of these. They are keystone, they are flagship, and they are umbrella species. Then we looked at factors that drive species to extinction, and there are two methods to conserve wildlife. Ex situ, which is off the site, and in situ, which is on the site. And in this case, we looked at 
the principles of reserve design. The principles of reserve design say that we should have big size reserves. We should have reserves that are closer together. We should have reserves that form a cluster and not a linear structure. We should have circular reserves. We should have connected reserves. Now, when we are making all of these different reserves, we need to also understand what are the benefits that we are getting from these. Now, remember that economic analysis is important because it aids us in making decisions. So when we are creating a reserve, we also need to know what are the benefits that we get out of it. And these are the ecosystem services. The benefits people obtain from the ecosystems. These include provisioning services, regulating services, supporting services and cultural services. And we can do a computation of all of these. So we have looked at the methods of valuation and we can use those methods of valuation to compute what is the value of the ecosystem services that we are getting from the protected area. And when we do that, then say in the case of uh, Panna Tiger Reserve, we get to this value that there is an investment multiplier of 1,939 rupees and 36 paise. Now this is telling us that if we invest into making a protected area, what are the returns? And the returns are pretty good. Then we looked at the economics of environmental disasters. And we saw that uh, in the case of disasters, in a number of cases, the disasters are because of the greed of people, because they want to take shortcuts, because they want to go for cost cuttings. And we looked at the Minamata disaster, in which case there was a company, the Tissot Corporation, that was dumping untreated waste into the sea. And these untreated industrial waste or the spent catalyst, they contained mercury. And once mercury was put into the sea, then we started to see a large number of symptoms. Fishes started to die, cats started to perform suicides. There were neurological disorders in a wide number of people. And later on, when this problem had to be solved, there was a cost of billions of yen. And so something that could have been prevented by, say, treating the chemicals before they are dumped into the sea, because that was not done, so the cost of treating the things became very large. And it also included a large amount of human impact, deaths, diseases, misery, sorrow. So these are things that could have been prevented. We looked at the Aral Sea. Now, in the case of the Aral Sea, it was a very large lake. And what uh, the government of that time did was to divert the water into agriculture and especially in the production of cotton. Once that happened, the sea started to shrink because now water was not reaching into the sea. The area started to reduce. The water became more saline. All the animals, all the organisms that were living in that sea, they died off. And the Aral Sea used to be a very good tourism location. Once the sea was gone, the tourism industry was gone. The fishing industry was gone. And at the same time, whenever there were dust storms, a huge quantity of dust and sand used to get into the communities and destroy the property. At the same time, people started to fall sick because now this area was too polluted. Now here again, if people used the resources sustainably, then they could have prevented this. So in this case, you can see that this is the size of RLC in 1974 and this is the size of RLC in 2016. Ma massive difference. We looked at the Bhopal gas tragedy. Now, in the case of the Bhopal gas tragedy, the companies were doing the cost cutting by keeping the methyl isocyanate uh, liquid stored in large containers. Why run the plants again and again? They shut down the refrigeration unit. The plant was ill-maintained. The sensors were not there. And whenever the gas leaked, there were, uh, were, uh, were preventive measures, such as flare towers. They were all shut down. There were chemical baths. They were shut down. Scrubbing towers shut down. And people were completely untrained. People were not uh, given the opportunity or training of how to respond. And because of that, we had thousands of deaths. And all of these were preventable deaths. Similarly, in the Love Canal tragedy, 
the industrial waste were dumped into the love canal and later on when houses came up on top of that canal when the schools were uh, were built then people were exposed to these chemicals all of these were preventable things if the waste had been treated then such a disaster would not have occurred and the remediation costs were too high and these are still an issue another case that we looked at was is the delhi smog now delhi smog is being caused because of temperature inversion because of the uh, local weather conditions but it is also showing us that there are preventable things such as stubble burning or things such as the vehicles the vehicular pollution or electricity generation so we are observing that quite a lot of these uh, negative consequences or the environmental disasters are occurring because either we are too greedy we are undergoing an unsustainable development or because we just do not pay heed but then the consequences are suffered by us only we our children our grandchildren have to suffer the consequences so it is right time that we heed to these so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind